First Corinthians chapter 13 verses 13 is the basis for this series. Of course, it says three things will last forever. There are three things that will remain. Paul says, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. These are the three things that will remain forever. Here is the interesting thing. In First Corinthians chapter 12, Paul begins to discuss about how we need to be one as a church. And each one in the church, each member of the body of Christ, is given a spiritual gift, he says. If, uh, if, you, if, you, if you actually look into your lives, look into uh, the kind of uh, talents of gifts God gave you, uh, you would recognize that God gave you all that so that you can serve the kingdom at large along with the rest of the body. So he talks about the unity and then he talks about spiritual gifts, various spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us so that we can serve the kingdom um, together for better. And talking about all those things, by the end of chapter 12, towards the end, the last verse, he says, Hey, now that I've talked about so many gifts, I want to tell you something. I'm going to give you something that is far more important than gift of prophecy, speaking in tongues, gift of doing miracles, and all those gifts. More than all those gifts, there is something else that is more important. And that is this. In chapter 13, he talks about then love. All through this chapter, he talks about, uh, you know, describes how love looks like. We'll come to love when we come to that, uh, the, uh, the, you know, that part of uh, this series towards the end. But and he closes chapter 13 with this statement, among all these, three things will remain. Faith, hope, and love. It's good to have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's good to operate in there. It's good to serve the kingdom of God. But what's really important for you and me, what really is important for you and me, is to have faith, hope, and love. Business. Faith, hope, and love are the three things that will help you to survive as a Christian on this earth, that will sustain you no matter what happens in your life, and here is what, that will take you safely to eternity. Those are the three things that will go with you. Those are the only three things that you really need. Of course you need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 14, he again goes back to that same topic and talks about, of course you also need all these gifts, but these are the three things that will help you to survive, to sustain, to safely enter your And That's why I want to talk about this. Sometimes it's good to come back to basics. Sometimes it's good to be, I know, go back to the scriptures that will really help us to be encouraged. And so this whole series is, is designed just simply to encourage you. So if you know these, it's okay if you know these. It's just that I want to say, hey, be encouraged. Little more. These three things will help us when everything else runs out. I remember uh, reading about a, uh, about a nun uh, who was working in a in a clinic, health clinic outside of a town. And one day, as she was uh, making her way, uh, driving her way through this uh, healthcare, you know, local home healthcare, uh, on on her way, as she's making her rounds to meet patients, she ran out of gas. And as she uh, got out of her car, she realized that there was uh, one gas station somewhere closer by. Um, so she walked to the gas station and walked to the clerk who was inside the gas station and asked it. Um, can I have a can in which I can take some gas and you know I can fill uh, my car and bring it bring it here all the way at least uh, up to this you know the gas station. The attendant uh, regretfully told her that he doesn't have any gas. He doesn't have any cans to take the gas. Um, the, the only one that he had has already been loaded out, so he really has nothing in his hand. So. She didn't know what to do, and, and this is what he said, Hey, I, I, I can understand the situation. Why don't you wait for some time? Maybe, uh, you know, that guy who took the can would actually come back uh, and, and give it to me, and so then you can take it. But she didn't have time, because she had to visit uh, the patient. So what she did is she went back uh, to search anything in her car, and the only thing that she found um, was a bed pan. Some of you don't know that bag, you know what it is, right? 
you don't know, you know. So I think that's the only thing she could find. So she just picked it up and walked all the way to the gas station. And she said, at least fill this, you know, I'll take it and try and fill um, something in, in the car. So he put the gas inside uh, the back pan and she just brought it all the way. And then as she opened the, opened the you know, nozzle uh, and, and she started putting it into this gas tank, two guys were walking on the other side of the road. They were interestingly watching what she was doing with this, this back pan and they didn't know what was in the back pan, right? So they both had having a conversation. The one guy looked at it, looked at, looked at, at the other guy and said, Man, I wish I had that kind of faith. <laughs> he has no idea what's happening. Sometimes we wish we have that kind of faith, right? Uh, it is faith that will actually sustain us, no matter how many body blows we get. I was uh, I was talking to I was having a conversation last week. We had a uh, pastors and leaders conference. Well, I was talking to uh, one of the speakers, and we were talking about how difficult it is to stand up as leaders, especially when you when you are the one who is getting beaten up most of the time. And he talked about this. Hey, it, it, being in leadership is like the boxing match. And, uh, and uh, if you want to win the match, you're going to be ready to be hit by the opponent. The, 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 the stronger he hits, the stronger you pick up. And that's what makes you a leader. That's what makes you keep going on. You, 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 need, to take, you need to be able to take the body blows before you can actually hit the punch. Does it make sense? Faith helps us to stand stronger. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Of course, that's the faith chapter. That's where we will obviously go uh, to talk on faith. Uh, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that we can see, that can be seen. It is by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God should give approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It is by faith Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For, uh, for before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. Now, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. I love this passage. We're going to explore a little bit of this passage. Well, actually, just two verses of, of uh, this particular passage. Here is something that I understood. Faith is the most powerful defense tool you and I have as a Christian. Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, verses 16. He says this uh, as he talks about the whole spiritual uh, uh, armor that we need to have. Uh, he talks about uh, faith as a shield that every Christian must have. In addition to all the things that the belt and, and the shoes and the helmet and, and all the, in addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith. To stop the fiery arrows of the devil. In our journey as a Christian, the one thing that Satan would do is to try and discourage us through his arrows, the fiery arrows of discouragement, of, of mocking, of uh, uh, failures consistently. The only way to survive that is to have the shield of faith. Whether it is close combat or whether it is a combat that is from afar, you still need the shield to protect yourself from arrows, to protect yourself from spears, and to, as you fight close combat, to protect yourself from the attacks of the sword. Faith is the only thing that can protect us here on the earth from being disappointed, from Giving up and walking away from the war that we are in. 
We all know that we should live by faith. But a part of the challenge uh, is this, that we don't exactly know how to define faith. Now, I'm not going to attempt to do that, but I'm just trying to give you just a thought to munch on today. Because uh, there are things like finances, relationships, career, family, that, 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 that kind of, you know, on which we need to get a hold on, and in the process of trying to get a handle on to those things, uh, it, it really becomes, you know, a hard journey for us, an uphill task for us. It's almost like a carrying a sandbag on our, on our shoulders as we go up. And as we carry all these burdens, drag us down, we, we wish that we had something to hold on to and keep going up. Faith is what helps us to get a handle on life when we are going up. I remember reading about a guy called Jack. As he was walking on a steep cliff, he accidentally got too close to the to, to the edge and fell. On his way down, as he's, he know he's going to go for a certain death, as he's falling down, um, to, 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 he was frantically trying to grab anything that he can, he can get on down, or, or at least you know, his hand can find. And finally he found something that he could hang on to a branch that just protruded out of uh, uh, this, this, this steep cliff. And even as he looked down, he, he, to his horror, he saw the, the, the canyon is too, too steep and too, too, too far uh, from the he is he is at least a thousand feet. And he knows that if, if he loses his grip on this, this branch, he's going to die. So he didn't want to look down, he's scared. I, I, I'm, by the way, I'm scared of heights. So he, I, 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 can, I can understand what Jack would be feeling at that point in time. As he didn't want to look down, the only thing that he could do is hang on to this, this, this flimsy branch that is coming out of uh, this cliff. Uh, and the only thing that he can do is to look up and try and cry out for help. Help! He started crying out. Somebody help me! And he kept yelling and yelling for help for a long time. Nobody heard him. Even as he was about to give up, he could hear a voice from somewhere. Can you hear me, Jack? Oh, there's a little way of hope. So he looked up and said, yes, yes, I can. I'm down here. Um, I can see you, Jack. Are you all right? Really? <laughs> That's a long question to ask you. I'm not all right. Uh, if, if you're there, there are you. I can't see you. Well, Zach, I'm God. I'm everywhere. God, you do it, God? God? Yeah, that's me. God, if you, if you can just please help me. Uh, please help me. Just, I know I've never been to church. I know I've never believed in you. But just one time, I promise you, if you can save me, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to, in fact, serve you for the rest of my life. That sounds like most of our prayers. I'll stop sinning and I'll really be a good person from now on. Oh, easy are the promises. Zach, uh, let's get you off. And then you can talk. Oh, alright, now. Now, here's what I want you to do leave the branch. Excuse me? Did you, did you, did you, can you repeat that? Leave the branch. Now, I don't think you're clear, God. Would you like to repeat that? Leave the branch. But that's what Jack thought for a long time. There was a silence, long pause. And then he began to say, Help! Help! Somebody else, please help me! <laughs> that sounds like our faith, you know. Give yourself a one, let me what I do. I like the way message. That. It goes on to say like this, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life a Think with me, think with me. The fundamental fact of existence is that this faith, this trust in God, is the firm, firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. 
It's our hand to our what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. Nice way to explain that. So basically, this is what we say. In three words, faith is this. Because of today, my whole focus is not defining faith. My whole focus is on the power of faith. It's on what faith is believing even when we don't see it. That's what he said. It's believing even when you don't see it. Number two, faith is obeying even when we don't understand it. That's faith. And faith, here's the point. Faith is worshipping even when you don't feel like it. It has what all, all these faith heroes that you look at chapter 11 did. They believed even when they didn't see it. They obeyed even when they didn't fully understand it. What's more, they worshipped even when they didn't feel like it. That's faith. When we have that kind of faith, something amazing happens. Do you know what something amazing, what that amazing thing is? Verse 6. It is impossible to please God without faith. In other words, and this is what he's saying. It is possible to please God. If you have faith, God is pleased over your life. God would be pleased with you. Now what happens when God is pleased with us? That's the question I want to talk about. Because that's where the secret is. The power of faith lies in that fact that if you can have faith and if God is pleased with your faith, something amazing begins to take place. Here is what happens. Number one, impossibilities without possibilities. You see, God is a God of possibilities. He uses, He changes impossibilities into possibilities. Now that's something we already know, but sometimes we really don't spend time thinking about it. I want to take you to the place where you know we are all familiar with the place called Red Sea. I want to call it the Red Sea experiment. When you go to Exodus chapter 14, and Moses, this reluctant leader, is leading 600,000 of them out of Egypt, out of slavery, and taking them to a land that is promised. He, know, he doesn't know where it is. God is going to take him there. Uh, he, uh, you know, uh, he know, he doesn't know how he's going to manage all these guys uh, uh, to, to, to and take them all the way that way to that place. But God told him to take them, so he is now, you know, leading them, and he brought them all the way to the tip of Red Sea. And as he's sitting there, he's, uh, you know, he, he's got a task in his hand. He has to take all these guys across the Red Sea. To make his problem worse is that the, the, the Pharaoh who let him go has changed his heart. He thought, no, I, I, that was a hasty decision. I should have done that. I'm, I'm going to get these fellows back. I'm going to use all my cheap labor right now. They're actually free labor. So I'm going to come back and get these fellows back to, back to Egypt. So he took all his army. Already he was angry with Moses and the things that took place in his country because of Moses. So he knows all, for all the suffering and all the loss of children in the, in the land of Egypt, the reason is all these Israelites, all these Hebrews and, and their leader Moses. So he is angry, he is revengeful, and he wants them. So there he is coming with his full force, uh, chasing them all the way to the Red Sea. And all these people who at first wanted to go with Moses, then they didn't want to go with Moses. Then they complained that, why did you come here, man? You made our life more miserable. I don't want, in fact, did you know, Moses had to go to God and say, God, nah, really, do you really want to deliver these fellows? They don't want me. They really don't want me. I don't want to be their leader. They don't want me to be their leader. And that's the kind of people who are following him right now, who are really doubtful about his leadership capability, who are really doubtful about, mm, I don't think this guy is going to make it. I don't know why you are going. The sound of coming out of Egypt is nice, but I'm not really sure whether this guy can do anything. 
And all the dogs came out now as they were facing the Red Sea. All of them started talking to them, talking to uh, Moses, begging all of them, all of them. His ears would have broken immediately. But I'm sure they picked up one loudest guy and sent him as their representative to talk to Moses. And so this guy is talking, he's the best at talking, uh, you know what he talks, the trash talk, maybe he's, he's shouting at his leadership capability and he's saying, you know what, we told you not to bring us out of here. That's what he said. We told you. We told you we don't want to follow you. Now that you brought us out of all the place, you put us in trouble, look at the army that is chasing and coming after us. We were better as slaves in Egypt than our hearts in the desert. That's what they said. I am better as a slave in, in, in Egypt than being a corpse in, in the desert. Why did you bring us to make us cops in the desert? That, if that doesn't discourage a leader, I don't want to discourage. He must have been really at the lowest part of his life. I still can't figure out how did he find out Courage to say what he said at that point of time. Actually, the positive words that came out of his mouth were, but don't be afraid, don't be afraid. God is going to do a miracle. I can give you a guarantee. Moses has no clue. Moses has no clue. There are a thousand times I did the same thing from this stage. Not this stage, the dialogue stage. Don't worry, God is going to do. I have no idea what God is going to do. And that's exactly what Moses did. Has no clue what God is going to do. In fact, you can see that it is true when it ends up to his conversation with God. God starts off talking to Moses and he says, Why are you crying? Moses is the only guy who is not crying yet. Do you know that? But God is talking to him and saying, Why are you crying? He knows that deep inside Moses is trembling with fear. He has no idea how he's going to face this impossibility. It's one thing to have impossible circumstances. It's another thing to have impossible people around you. Have you ever had these kind of uh, you know employees or employers or family members who are like, oh my God, I don't know how do you how do you convince these guys that? And, and, and God tells him, the worst part of this conversation is, is this, that, that, I don't know whether it's worse, it's a great thing, but here's what God tells him, hey, take your staff and do a miracle. No, no, <laughs> it's you who's supposed to do a miracle. God tells him, no, 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 take your staff and divide the Red Sea. Really? Can you imagine you being there? I thought you were going to help me. But you're asking me to do what is impossible, God. You're asking a man to do what is impossible. That's not going to happen. No, no, take your staff and divide the next sea. And they will walk through the dry land and they will know that I've got. He's not doing anything there. I've got to do it. And then people would know that God is God. Now, so Moses is thinking now, I've got an impossible situation, and I've got impossible people around me, and then I've got an impossible task in my hand. I have no idea how I'm going to do this. He comes and he sits there, I'm sure, because he actually sat through the whole night, by the way. Bible does say that the whole night of it blew. So it didn't take place immediately. Now, I, actually, I can imagine Moses sitting with his staff, and at the shore and thinking, scratching his head, not absolutely no clue what's going to do. But how, how is this going to happen? And the representative, I can imagine the representative, walking up to Moses and saying, so what are you going to do about our situation right now? When God told me to divide the sea. Can you imagine the reaction of this guy? This guy is this. This guy is this. As he looks at him, I knew you were insane, man. <laughs> I knew. I told people not to follow you. When you have a voice 
process like that, you have no idea how to live your life, right? But that's one thing that he did. It's God who told him to do. He told him to do certain things before, and Moses did it, and Moses saw what happened. So I'm assuming that's the only flicker of faith that he had. That he did something before. Maybe he will do something now. And maybe that's why he stood up. That picked up his hand. Sure it makes sense. That whole night he had to stand there and watch that. It didn't happen instantly. The Bible says the wind came through the night and somebody did the next That would have taken a long time. 12 hours is a long time. Well, for, you know, 12 hours is a long time, but compared to the time during his three that was nothing. That was instant action. Impossibilities become possibilities. Now, the same guy, the representative, look at his face. Because Bible does describe his face as he watches the Red Sea becoming and dry ground in the middle. It's not that the sea went, the sea had it just separated. You know, sometimes like, ah, 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 ah. The, the one movie that actually did justice to that is a, is a movie called Prince of Egypt. And then that's, you know, in Exodus, that was one movie that did justice to what took place there, how Bible describes it. That the sea parted and became a wall. It was not a flat sea, it was a wall. Like this. That's impossible. That's not going to happen. That doesn't take place in. in, 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 in this, 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 this is not natural. As they walked through it, can you imagine the wonder on the faces of the kids, on the guys who were for the first time seeing blue whales passing by and. and, uh, and um, Fernandas around it, uh, uh, I don't know what sea creatures, everything passing by, coming all the way to the edge, maybe poking their noses out, but walking back, going back. You know. I, I really want to see the face of the guy who actually said, Yeah, that's not possible. A little bit of faith. Possibilities become possibilities. You just have to be here. See, God is looking for A.W. Tozer says this. God is looking for people through whom He can do impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. There's so much truth in His word. That Christians, we plan to do things, things only we can do. But God is actually looking for people who can do, through whom He can do impossible things. Impossibilities turn into possibilities. Number two, uncertainties turn into certainty. Uncertainties turn into certainty. A priest, an evangelist, and a minister were, uh, were on a road boat in the middle of a pond on their fishing trip. Um, none of them had caught anything all day. So, you know, it, it was very too late. The evangelist got up and says, you know, he needs to go to the bathroom. So he climbs out of the boat, starts walking on the water to the shore. Comes back ten minutes later the same way. A few minutes later, the minister decides that he also wants to go to the washroom. So he also climbs out of the boat, starts walking to the shore. He also comes back by the same road 10 minutes later. Now, looking at these two guys, the pastor is thinking, they have that kind of faith, I also should do this, right? So he also got up and he says, Well, I also have enough faith, strong enough faith to walk on the water. And he says, I need an idea to go wash. And he gets on the boat, and there he goes, like splashing into the water. And as he's drowning, the minister and the evangelist are talking to each other. I suppose we should have told him where the rocks are. <laughs> when they both 
kind of rocks. Imagine Peter. In Matthew chapter 14, you see this amazing, uh, you know, I mean, all the movies and uh, I'm uh, too good to describe even the happening. Jesus walking on the water in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, uh, uh, you know, they almost thought he was a ghost, and as he walked it, coming all the way to, to, to the boat, they, they're scared, they hear the voice of Jesus saying, I am, and then that's when they realize it was Jesus, and then Peter birthing out and say, uh, if it is Jesus, can I walk on the water too? Sometimes our faith is like Peter's. Um, we do believe that impossibilities are possible, possible. Uh, it can become possible. But when it comes to stepping out of the ball, we are uncertain. Not really sure. I believe that God can do miracles. I do know that God can turn impossibilities into possibilities. But in my case, I'm uncertain. I'm really doubtful. You know, it's really funny when we were discussing this talk. They started, I, I wrote it on the board. So it's an into certainties. And I asked our team, hey, can you Google and find out exactly what it means by uncertainty? Did you know Google doesn't know how to describe that? Google actually says, being in the state of uncertainty. <laughs> really? I just asked the meaning of uncertainty, and it says, being in the state of uncertainty. It's, it's a state where. You have faith, but you're really not sure it's going to work right now. It's a, it's a thought, it's a little bit of thought, it's a little bit of, a, I don't know how to explain that. Tell like Peter. There's a brilliant book by, uh, by an author called John Hartberg. Uh, the title itself is a giveaway, right? And the title of the book is this, If you want to walk on the water, get out of your boat. Nice, nice title. If you really want to walk on the water, you're going to get out of the boat. The reason we don't get out of the boat is we're uncertain. We do believe in miracles, we do believe in walking on the waters, but we don't really believe that we can do that. I could almost imagine the mindset of Peter as he's stepping onto the water. Thousand things must be running in his head. That he sees Jesus, his eyes are on Jesus, as he's getting out onto the it's almost like what you know, putting your feet onto nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's it's it's, it's nice to see Jesus walking on the water. I am not really sure that I can do this. But when do you think the miracle would have taken place? Now, physically it's impossible for me to do the miracle right now. So, I'm just going to assume, this is water. It's not when he put the first step onto the water, it's when he lifted the second one. The miracle took place. You see, between the first one, first foot, and the second foot, is uncertainty. That's where we are. For the most part, our lives are stuck there. Does that make sense? When you begin to lift this in faith, so uncertainty is become certain. The step of faith fall on something that seems void, but they find the rock beneath. When you take a step of faith, it looks as if you are stepping onto void. But the moment you take that step, you find yourself on the rock. Number three, that's a powerful thing. Number three. What is unseen turns into reality. What is unseen turns into reality. There's an interesting observation about African Impala. African Impala, you know, the Goat looking, I don't know what you call it, but this, uh, this deer looking like thing. Thin, nice, beautiful looking. Can actually jump uh, a height of over 10 feet. 
it can actually jump a height of over 10 feet. Uh, it, it, it can cover a distance of 30 feet in its one single leap. That's the strength this African power has. Yet, these magnificent creatures um, can be kept in an enclosure in a zoo with a three foot tall ball. That's funny. Do you know why? Because African impalas don't jump unless, unless they see the ground on the other side. So because of this three foot tall uh, wall, since they cannot see what's on the other side, they don't jump. But yet they can jump. Yet they have the ability to jump. For many reasons, for, for, for many of us, the only excuse that we have is we can't see it. Even though we have the ability, even though God gave us the drive, the passion, the, 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 the talent to do that, and He gave us the purpose, which you know for sure you can do this, you can't see, so therefore you don't take the step. That's why what is clean remains clean. What is a dream business remains a dream. What is a dream profession remains a dream. What is a dream home remains, uh, remains a dream. What is a dream marriage remains a dream. Since you can't see what is on the other side, you don't take the risk. Stop. So this is when I realized this, that all Satan has to do is to just build a three-feet wall for some of us. When the dog spoke to Sarah and said, uh, that uh, by next year she's going to she's going to bear a child. She laughed, right? That's what Bible says. She laughed. I don't think she laughed in a mocking sense, but I think she laughed in a sense. That's not possible. I think she laughed in a sense. I've never seen that happening. Nobody ever bore a child at right? my age. I don't think it's possible. Physically it was impossible for us to imagine that as a reality. For some of you, it is physically impossible to imagine that what the dream that God gave you, uh, uh, you know, it seems like impossible and that's why you don't want to take this type of thing. But Joseph, the dreams that he had, even though he, know the, he knows the meaning of those dreams, but circumstantially, it is impossible for him to achieve what he was, what he, what, what he dreamt. Your circumstances may tell you that the dream that you have cannot become a reality. It, it could be possible that the economy that is around you is crumbling, and you're thinking this is not the right time for me to do any investment. This is not the right time for me to do business, even though. I want to, I feel that this is the time, what is around me doesn't make sense. I'll tell you, for Nehemiah, positionally it is impossible. The job that he has and the dream that he has, no connection. Absolutely no connection. Uh, you know, a cup bearer in a king's palace is dreaming about going and changing a country. That's not going to happen. For some of you, you could be feeling that's exactly the same thing. My job, my qualification, where I am today, my position, mm, makes it impossible for me to achieve what God is asking. But when he stepped out on faith. The beauty of the Hamaya story is in just first seven chapters. Eh? After that, and now of course he writes a lot of history, but just in fact, even the first six chapters, beautifully described chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. Every day he had an obstacle in the form of his position, in the form of governors and, and the resources, in the form of uh, opposition. Who were walking and then started intimidating, then started destroying the work that he had. He had impossible uh, people, he had impossible circumstances, he had impossible things around him, 
to, to deal with and to accomplish his dream. But why do the way he finishes chapter 6 is, is, is brilliant. But God enabled us to full, fulfill our dream in 52 days. In spite of so many impossibilities around him, what was unseen before has become reality. That's what faith can do. Can turn your dream into a reality. Augustine says like this. I want to say that and then go through the words. Augustine says this. Faith is to believe what we do not see. And the reward of faith is to see what we believe. You understand? Faith is to believe what we do not see. And the reward of faith is to see what we believe. I think sometimes we need to pray the prayer that Elijah, Elisha prayed for his servant. When this army, army is surrounded, uh, the surrounding his home, little home in Dota, all village, all house, huge army. So he is scared. He thinks his life is finished now. His master's life is finished. That's why he frantically comes to Elisha. Second Kings chapter 6, and he's saying, Master, there's a huge army outside, they're going to kill us. I don't know how we will find our way through this impossible situation. Elijah comes out and looks at this guy and prays to God, God, open this fellow's eyes. Maybe we need to pray that prayer to him. God, open my eyes to see what you do. Or maybe for some of us, we need to hear the words of Jesus to Jairus. As um, Jairus is coming and kneeling his home, his friends walk up to him and they are saying that your dog is dead. You know, there's no point troubling the master, why don't you send him back? And Jesus looks at him and says something brilliant, something that we need to remember. He looks at him and says, don't be afraid, it's nothing. I like the way it is translated in the message version. This is what message version says. Don't listen to them. Just believe. There are a thousand people around you who are saying it's impossible. Those are not the voices you need to listen. One voice that you need to listen is Jesus. So it's just this whole the whole part of this message is this. Just believe. We got a God who can do things that are unimaginable, undescribed. He can do that on your behalf. 